you welcome to the Vast and Ominous Comic Book Vault. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Dan. Dan, welcome back to the show. It's so good to see you. Thanks for having me back. I'm uh, glad to be here. It's uh, going to be good to get back to reviewing some Simons and Thor after a while. Yes. I feel like it's been long since we've done it again, but I'd like to get back to it. It's back to the mighty cask of ancient mighty <laughs> Thors. Uh, so we're back to the crazy giant tome of Walt Simonson's Thor. Uh, boy, have we been having a, a lot of fun reviewing this for the last several months to a year and uh, uh, every now and again we finally get back to this uh, luckily we've only got two more trades after this uh, we might even be able to knock that out in one video that's possible that could happen we'll see yeah, uh, I, could. I, I can't remember where the stories begin and end in those trades so we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out accordingly anyway today we are reviewing uh, issues 360 to 369 um, <laughs> uh, 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 children open up your textbooks and uh, Dan Dan has the uh, Visionaries volumes, and so uh, his are a little bit different than mine. The first thing I want to mention is that uh, if you're looking at this, uh, this this has everything in the uh, correct reading order, and those are a little bit off. So um, today we are not reviewing the Balder mini that Walt Simonson um, also wrote that uh, has everything to do with what's going on in this and gives you a bunch of background about where Balder was um, uh, at, at, a, at a certain point that's kind of crucial to this. Uh, but it it, it shows up in issues uh, in this thing and in uh, Dan's, it's in the next volume. So we're not going to get yeah. it till later. So uh, the next one of these that we do, we're going to have to backtrack and get to that. So that that we won't be covering today. Uh, but 360 to 369, um, I'll give a uh, really quick, Dan, uh, synopsis of what happens. Basically, uh, within these issues, Thor goes to hell and then he turns into a frog <laughs> and then uh, he goes and rescues Balder from some trolls at a castle so that he can become king of uh, Asgard. That's what that's what happens. Yes, uh, this is kind <laughs> of after the big server story, I mean it's cool to get these kind of like mini stories. They're still like running throughout the ongoing narrative and we're still continuing threads from the Surtur stuff, obviously, because we're dealing with the fallout of Odin leaving, yes. dying, whatever that that ends up being. <clears throat> um, and uh, there's a lot of like you know Loki making a bid for the throne, uh, you know, uh, Asgardian pseudo politics. It's not like in, in depth or anything, but like it's a bunch of it's a Game of Thrones. You know, they're all trying to like you know rule and stuff like that. And uh, the the shenanigans Thor gets into in this <laughs> volume are some of the most ridiculous of the run, I think. But they're so much fun. Like, especially you were mentioning when he turns into a frog. I mean, not even when he, he gets the hammer and turns into a 6'6 six, six giant frog with Thor clothes on. That Don't get me wrong, that's awesome. That is but awesome. This whole, like, couple issue story about Thor as a frog and, like, fighting this war against rats and he, like, resourcefully recruits alligators to help him win this war for this, like, civilization of frogs. And it's surprisingly really endearing and really interesting. You get invested in, in some of the frog characters, um, along with all the Asgardian plots moving forward. And um, I think well, Simonson gets a lot of character stuff done with Thor and Balder, and uh, Bal Thor and Balder in particular, and then some of the supporting cast members as well. But yeah, I, I don't, again, I feel like we just gush over this every time we review new issues of it, but, you know, more. I think it's warranted. Uh, this isn't as on big of a it's on big of a scale as some of the other things we've read. I mean, the stakes are still high. We still have the the, the throne of Asgard as like the the end stakes, but it's not like you know Ragnarok, all existence coming to an end kind of scale. So it's a breather on the scale of Thor, uh, I suppose, right? Yeah, and of course, when you have something that big, that's like the, yeah. the, the whole universe is at stake, that kind of thing, uh, if you keep going there, and I feel like in a lot of present-day comics we have this problem, where um, we might do like a couple issues of Breather, but then we go right back to that kind of stuff, um, it gets dull, it gets boring. Um, you know what's going to happen, you know what I mean? And so uh, you, you, kind of, you kind of have to bring it back 
I want to say bring it back down to Earth, but then we have Frog Thor, and that doesn't really work. But 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 like but like I guess what I mean is you have to bring it to more of a personal place. And like this book is always about uh, these characters on a personal scale on top of the big grand scale stuff. It, Simonson always does a really great job of balancing that, where I care about the people involved, but then also the stakes are everything might come to an end. But then uh, with this stuff. I think we live with these characters long enough away from that that we can kind of forget about that big scale of stuff for a while. So that if he ever goes back to it, we we can we can you know get get invested and excited about the big grand scale stuff again. Having said that, something I'm really impressed with with the whole Frog Thor thing, and we, we should get into that in depth here in a little bit. But like, um, and we're not just talking about that. Uh, if you haven't read this, just because oh my god, it's crazy. Thor turns into a frog. It's like four issues, like it's half of this, he's a frog. And, um, yeah, what, he's a frog for a while. Yeah, and so, so, uh, so basically, uh, uh, what, what, uh, what happens there, what I'm so impressed, <laughs> yeah, what I'm so impressed with is that kind of the most important and most epic stuff in this particular issue, or in this in this particular um, uh, set of issues, this trade, um, with the exception, I suppose, of the big fight between Thor and Hello, which is really exciting. Um, yeah, it's awesome. Is the is uh, uh, when he's a, a frog and he goes up against Loki, who has like like that's actually a really gripping sequence. Like he's a big frog guy. But like, it's this—it's kind of the big throwdown fight you've been waiting for to get to see with those characters, right? I mean, like, like, like Loki yeah. has really inserted himself into the Asgardian framework. He's about to win and take the throne, and I buy it. Like, 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 like I'm. Buy he has such a cool speech right before that happens, where he's where, where he's explaining to the Asgardians why he should be put on the throne, and he's admitting that he's a trickster and that he's manipulated people in the past and all of that. But then he says, "But, but look what I've done for you lately." And he has this like this like big list of how you know you know um um he like uh, went up against Surtur and all that stuff and like you could tell when he was doing that you remember that panel that i was talking about that i love so much you know for for, for asgard for misgard for myself um you could you could tell even there that he was that he's always plotting and scheming stuff forward right and so yeah. um and so there he's finally paying that off um he he uh he has this pretty clever ruse where he convinces everybody that he uh is able to lift the thor's hammer because he's worthy and if he can conv convince him of that he's worth being put on the throne um so like, so like you've got all that like really kind of kind of epic, in, important regal stuff going on. At the same time, as Thor's a, a frog, and he's turning. I mean, like it's Loki that turns him into a frog. So it's grounded in the sense that at least it's not random. Like it's all it's all interconnected. Um, and he also does some really interesting thematic stuff with that that I was surprised by. Like, okay, so there is like more. Of like uh, of like uh, characters not knowing who each other are in this that I've ever read and read in any comics like it's so Shakespearean right the mistaken identity all <laughs> over this book constantly I mean you uh, you think this person is this person but they're really this person there's even a guy that pretends to be Thor just so that uh, it's harder for Loki to get the crown and it turns out that he's just a guy who looks a lot like Thor and he just puts on a Thor costume I thought that was pretty <laughs> great um, and apparently he came from some other book that I never read though from from way before remember that one time this guy pretended to be Thor. Um, I thought it was really interesting that in um, that in uh, uh, trying to to figure out if that guy really was Thor, uh, Loki turns himself into a fly while Thor is a frog. For I that too, foreshadowing yeah. anybody, right? Yeah. Like that. That's cool. Because uh, because the frog Thor is gonna pop up and uh, he's gonna swat the fly. You know, he's gonna eat the fly. Um, that's uh, he doesn't literally eat Loki, but, <laughs> but, but you know, like ah, uh, that stuff, man. It's it's really cool. How was I that gripped by Thor as a frog? And then it was still hilarious, right? Yeah. Like, I, I love superhero stories like this because, like, they're able to tell heavy character kind of s stories, but at the same time, they're not taking themselves too seriously. Where I'm like, this is still guys in capes. Let's bring it. Let's bring them down just the, the, the smidgen, guys. Like we can, have, we can have fun. Simonson walks that line very finely, and uh, the best uh, as I've seen anybody do it. Uh, I love the character stuff we we have with Thor in here. Um, 
beginning with the you know the immediate fallout of the Odin thing where he's dealing with death and he does what Thor would do to deal with death he goes and tries to hit it with his hammer yes. and uh, he uh, goes down there and he's somewhat successful he rescues some mortals which is kind of standard fair for Thor but he still isn't able to get what he wants and I really like that and he comes out scarred he he um, and, and the, the table were turned in, in the favor of the Asgardians when it comes to Ragnarok, too, because they destroy the ship that the dead are supposed to invade eventually. So there's a lot of talk about uh, life and death and the stakes between them being equal. And Thor says, you know, you stole these mortal souls. You know, you have defied life and you, 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 you tip the scales in your favor. And then at the when they leave Hell is Realm, you know, the, they tip the scales in their favor. So Thor is going to have to deal with those repercussions down the line. Um, for the actions of someone that was under his um, command, which was the executioner, who ended up sacrificing himself somewhat heroically um, to, to let them uh, exit Hell's realm. So I liked all of that stuff. Simonson's really good at that kind of thing. Just as he is making me intentionally not like someone, he turns yeah. them around and makes them more three-dimensional. That, now, that's not to say, if you're writing a story, that just because you take a guy who's always done bad things and then suddenly self-sacrifices himself, that automatically makes him a likable character. I've seen this done in gimmicky ways before, where it's like, well, but he sacrificed himself. Yeah, but does it make sense? Do I buy that this guy as I know him, would go there. This guy I did, and I was surprised by that. Um, and and uh, and like part of it was he had a sense of humor about it. He was kind of he, he he was he was kind of fun. And like also, um, you know, you know, the executioner, he uh, uh, like like was not really a traitor. Like they make you kind of think that he is, but he was duped. And he has to make up for that, you know. So it's not. So it's not really that he like doesn't care about Asgard and like he like like at the last minute he has a change of heart. It's he was too gullible because he thought the enchantress was there and it's not her, and so right. Yeah, and that's totally a thing with his character. Like what I loved about the sacrifice so much is he's a guy that's gullible to a fault in that. I don't think this guy has ever made a choice of his own accord before. Yeah. And then he finally makes one, and it's this epic sacrifice, right, to, to save the Asgardians and be in the good favor of, of Thor and uh, his compatriots. Um, that's what makes it so heroic, because, you know, he's always under the uh, thumb of the Enchantress. She kind of takes him for granted, um, you know, just uses him as a henchman when he is, you know, legitimately in love with her because of how seductive and, you know, the sorcery thing that she does. Um, so I really liked that, and uh, it was kind of cool to see him and then the Asgardians in general go in to save the mortals into this this mystical death realm with mortal weapons because they're using like M16s and stuff they had on yeah, Earth. That was like, I, I thought that was a really interesting juxtaposition. They got um, oddly just... excited about having those weapons. Yeah. <laughs> And that's how the executioner goes out. He's got two M16s in his hand. He's just blowing these like zombies away, and uh, it's a really kind of intense scene. I thought it was neat that they ended him. They they ended him. Uh, that that, <laughs> that, uh, that that he go he goes out. Because uh, if you haven't read this, the whole idea is if you go into hell, you're not supposed to be able to come out. Of course, and uh, yes. and uh, Thor is about to make this big epic sacrifice, but then this, the executioner comes along and does it for him. Thor's really surprised. He thought he was done. He thought this was the end of me, and. Um, mm -hmm. And, and uh, I thought it was really cool uh, the juxtaposition of seeing a guy who uh, whose only only existence I mean, he only exists to kill things and he saves everybody by 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 killing things but then letting himself be, be killed he uses that to positive ends and what, what's what's cool about it is um, he says I love seeing a character like this go out like this he says um, I'm going to uh, do what I do best. Mm -hmm. and, and, and and he's killing things. That, that, that's what he's good at. Uh, but he as you said, he has he has the freedom of choice there. How much of this whole thing has been about people being manipulated in various ways by other people and not having a choice? Um, how much of this particular section is about Thor? Um, having to deal with the repercussions of something he, something uh, horrible he did to Sif when he hit her uh, uh, earlier. Um, yes. That uh, that that he, he does that um, not you know you know while he was uh, being being mind controlled by Lorelai and like that's 
but, but, but through Loki. And uh, so, like, you know, it's kind of Loki's fault. But then, uh, so, so, you know, you've got, you've got that going on. You've got people dealing with, uh, you know, you know, you know um, not, having, not having choices, the repercussions of what you did when you didn't have a choice. Now you have a choice. How do you deal with it? You know what I mean? It was your body that did it. Is it your fault or not? And then, um, and they sort of kind of make up. But, I mean, like, I can kind of understand why she's still mad at him because even though he, he didn't mean to do that, he's not handling it right. You know what I mean? And, yeah, and so, exactly. so So, uh, I and then, um, along the same lines, you've got uh, what you were talking about with the Enchantress and the Executioner. You have that paralleled with Lorelai and Loki, but backwards, where we have Loki treating Lorelai the way that uh, the Enchantress was was treating the Executioner, and so you yeah, know, that's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. I didn't think of it either until you brought that up. And so, like, like you know, you have all these people using each other. And the reason I bring this up now is because I feel like Sif kind of feels used by Thor. And mm-hmm. she loves Thor. She's been in love with Thor all this whole time. She is, she is left Beta Ray Bill, uh, who she also has affection for and could easily be with. He he wants her, um, yeah. in order it, because she because she cares so much about Thor and he's not reciprocating. And more than that, he's not really the right kind of apologetic about the stuff that happened before. And um, so so yeah, you've got a lot of people using people. So you have actual mind control type manipulation on top of the way real people manipulate each other. Exactly. And I love the way that it's handled with the the hitting thing with Sif in that, like, it's not... It's all about, like, honor and respect for her. Like, she, as a woman, does not want to feel disrespected by Thor in that way, and I find that very respectable uh, as a a person, you know. Um, It very... I mean... Not that I want to downplay, like, you know, nobody should hit each other in relationships, man or woman, like, no one should be beaten, but it very could have, like, came off in a sort of whiny way, um, like, in being unfair to Thor, because Sif, I think Sif is fair to Thor, you can see why she's mad at him, like you said, because he's not handling it right, but she could have been very, like, unapologetic to him in the same way, you know what I mean? Like, he could, it could the roles could have been reversed. She, yeah, she could be blaming him entirely for it. Like, I, like, like yes. you, know, you know, how dare you do, you did this on purpose. No, like you said, it's more of a respect thing. It's, it's more of, um, you know, this doesn't happen to ladies of my stature. Exactly, and yeah. we must address that it happened. Because I don't remember, wasn't it in front of people? Like, they weren't alone. Like, people yeah, know about Lorelai it. Yeah, and had told him to do it or something like that when yeah. he had went back, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a stature thing, and I mean, like, you know, you might see that as as she's being kind of full of herself or whatever, but remember, these are regal people, you know? This is a particular yeah. kind of civilization, society. Um, so, uh... Yeah, and Simonson gets all that. Like, the culture of the Asgardians is so um, rich, and see, that's one of the things I love about this book and what I thought... I mean, we talked about the movies a little bit in the last one, and I don't want to talk about it too much, but the, the one thing I really love about this run is, like, we're traversing, like, the realm of hell. That's, like, the, the, the realm we're traversing in this book. How cool would it have been to see, like, that, like, the cold, like, um, icy version of hell from uh, Asgardian mythology in this, um, this, this comic version of it in, in the movies? How cool would it be to see Hela realized on screen? Yeah, that would yeah. be awesome. Um, I thought she was just fascinating um, yeah, I, thought she, I, I think thought, she's a great villain. I thought all the stuff about uh, about mortality was really cool. Uh, the, the 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 idea of like it's not just a matter of like like uh, like 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 being dead and being thrown into hell is 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 awful and and, and totally sucks. But like um, the worst possible thing is uh, is aging rapidly. Uh, like like uh, like there's a, there's a lot of stuff about about um, about time and how and how how scary time is and like. Hella's um, best, best and scariest ability is to make people age really fast. I think it's really interesting that, that to see that power for death itself it makes a lot of sense, right? Because like we're yeah. we, we all get we all eventually get killed by old age. Um, I like that. Yeah, I like that too. And one of the things I've always found to be so interesting about that character too, and they don't mention it in this because they never really have any interaction. I don't know if you know this, but Hella is Loki's daughter. Okay, you've told me that, but I forgot about yeah. it. Yeah. 
Well, I, I think that's really cool too. Oh, that's now cool. that you, I'm sorry. Now that you mentioned something about about lineage, um, I this I, I was just reminded of a question I wanted to ask you. Um, sure. I should ask you this before the show. Um, I didn't know unless I'm reading this wrong. So Frigga is not Thor's birth mother. No. Um, he Thor's has a birth... human birth mother. Yes, I believe so. That's what he says in this. Her name is yes. like it starts with a J. It's like it's like. Uh, I wrote it down. Yeah, I think it was a Norse woman. Sort it of like how Norse Zeus would woman. go down and um, have illegitimate children with mortals. See, I didn't know he was only half Asgardian. Yeah, I, I guess so. That's um, fascinating. I, I kind of forgot that it was a, a mortal, to be they honest don't, with you. Well, because he says, when he says, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a child of two worlds, I was like, <laughs> well, because you adopted Earth. And then he says, because I've got an Earth birth mother. And I was like, what and then this whole idea, this whole notion of um, my loyalties are split, makes a lot more sense when you put it, when you put it in that context. Because otherwise, yeah. it seems a lot more selfish that he would refuse to take the throne. If you haven't read this, what 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 Thor does in this is um, he he has every right to take the throne because he is he is uh, you know Odin's son, and um, you know unless Loki can. Can uh, make people think that he deserves it more, but um, but uh, like 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 he's after the Loki thing happens, um, Thor is able to come in and basically just take the throne, but he doesn't want it, and he instead uh, tries to put Balder on the throne, which is immediately interesting, and we should talk about that in a minute. Um, sure. The differences between those two men because they've never been highlighted the way they are here, and uh, mm -hmm. what what uh, so so what happens is uh, Thor decides not to take the throne, and um, it's because he says he's a, he's a child of both worlds. And uh, his real reason is because he'd prefer to be an adventurer. I mean, that's really it. He talks about that. <laughs> like, you know, if I if I was the king, I wouldn't be allowed to go on these sorts of adventures and things. And that's what he really wants to do. And that's and that's what he thinks he's better at is the is the fighting and the hitting stuff with a hammer. Um, yeah. But but. Uh, he he uh, he has this nice moment where he's really conflicted, and I, and I feel like we get a more internalized Thor in this section than we ever have before. Where like mm -hmm. he's he's really he's really looking deep within himself and and, and trying to um, thoughtfully make make decisions, and he questions himself quite a bit, and and, and, and he's he's uncertain sometimes. And I, I, I kind of enjoyed um, seeing him seeing him that way. I don't mean flaky. I just mean he's 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 considering things, and he's got this he's got right. this moment. I mean, it's a big decision whether or not you're going to take on the you know, kingship of one of the most powerful realms in all the nine. Yeah, and he's got this, uh, he's got this really important moment where he says uh, that, that he doesn't know if he's going against his lineage, if this is somehow like, like, a, like wrong of him because it's not what Odin would want, it's against his line. Um, but then when you put in the fact that he has an Earth Mother, it kind of makes a lot more sense. It was interesting that he didn't bring that up at that moment. That doesn't happen, that's not mentioned until way later. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think it's interesting, you know, when you think about um, um, Balder was the only uh, pure-blooded Asgardian with a claim to that throne out of all of Odin's children, which is interesting. Um, yeah. Because Loki's part frost giant. Um, so I don't know if... Uh, that's probably what Simonson maybe is trying to say with that and like sp having them take the throne either of them Thor or Loki would be betraying their birthright birthright to some degree because Loki sort of does have that birthright of being the scheming evil um, enemy of the Asgardians he wouldn't be fit to sit on the throne he wouldn't have their best interests in mind necessarily he's all about personal gain right which of course. is embodied in that panel you were talking about um, but what's interesting is We've read this much of this, and I never knew that Thor was either part human or at least mm -hmm. had that heritage. But you always hear about it with Loki. Like, like there's mm -hmm. never a moment where you, where you you forget that Loki is part Frost Giant and that he has that heritage behind him too, and that that's that's conflicting, and that that's but that that nature is part of the reason he is the way he is. Um, nobody talks about that with Thor. Like, like, like Thor is just straight up as guardian to everybody. Is it about his attitude? Is it just because of the way he presents himself? What is it? That's how you can see, like, Loki's point of view to some degree, right? Because you see, like, right. Thor is the prodigal son where, you know, he's got lineage issues just like me. But because um, I was born of a different, uh, you know, 
mother or father um, that was having to be a frost giant, I'm ostracized and looked at as the, the bad son and all that, that sort of thing. Um, it makes you kind of feel bad for him to some degree. And Loki is a very sympathetic character um, throughout this and as in general, I think. Um, some of the best here, I think, are with him and uh, Lorelai comedic wise, and kind of sad too, seeing him treat her so poorly. You yeah. Know? Well, and and, and <laughs> then and then again, you get that uh, kind of you get that kind of parallel between them and uh, and uh, Thor and Sif, where even even despite the the issues Thor and Sif have and the way Thor, Thor has a character arc where he gets over that, and and mm-hmm. uh, he and he has a, a really nice sincere apology to her that I that, that, that I that I totally bought, and I didn't feel like it like it like it like belittled him or compromised him or anything. It was a really good moment, and um, you know you see that relationship versus you know Loki and uh, and Lorelai who like he is he doesn't care. You know, like like he is really just using her, um, and he's so superficial about it too. Like he's got that really weird moment where he where he uh, he, he uh, thanks her for being around and the prettiest girl that has been around <laughs> in a while, and that's about it. If she lost that, he would throw her out in the garbage. Like that's it. You know, she's attractive and has really useful superpowers. Uh, that's yeah, you, you know. <laughs> That's a that's about it or potions I guess but yeah that's about it. Yeah, see, like Loki's not capable of being invested in anyone other than himself at this point, right. which is uh, sad and tragic. But you, he, he's the kind of character that you love to hate in that sort of way. Um, that's what I I really uh, took from those scenes, um, and especially when he turns Thor into a frog here, which is like the classic like. Because I'm gonna start talking about that. Oh yes, absolutely. No, we gotta no, we gotta bring up Frog Thor. Frog Thor! Na 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 Frog Thor! <laughs> but anyway, uh, Loki turns Thor into a frog here, and uh, I don't know. Loki has a kind of funny sense of humor in that way too, where he's like going for like the old like Athurian myths, where it's like the prince of the, the frog kind of thing. Yeah, I don't know they if that's really play that like King up, Arthur, like... But, like medieval myths. You know what I mean? What I wondered, because I knew the Frog Thor thing happened, because I've seen the covers and stuff. Yeah. And I always expected that, that to be like a one shot, just kind of silly. Okay, we're gonna do a ridiculous thing here, and then we're gonna pretend like mm-hmm. it never happened. I could not believe that it was part of the main story. Like it was really important. I couldn't believe that. Uh, but like, like they uh, they they make it the whole Frog Prince thing. It actually happens from a kiss. Uh, it's it's backwards, but like they they put that in there. Right. Yeah. And. Um... I think it's cool to put Thor in that kind of situation because he connects with Midgard in a way that he never has before. Um, he's, since he's from another realm, he's usually just worried about the people because they're the people that are of his birthright. Like you said, they worship him. He looks like them, um, the people of Midgard. And then you see, like, you know, he never really considers the rest of the life on the planet and what's yeah. best for them. So you put him in the position of an animal, and it's a whole new perspective for him where he's able to look at things on a little bit of a smaller level. And um, I don't know, I thought, you know, that was kind of touching to see Thor, like, have to have to deal with Midgard in a different way. And he, and he was still treating the animals as he would people because he's yeah. not the kind of person, like, he wasn't raised here, so he doesn't have a distinction of, like, humans being higher or lowlier than animals, if you know what I mean. Um, he just looks at them as equal sort of inherently when he's turned into the frog. He's like, oh, I'm going to help these these frogs because I need my help, you know? Yeah, although I read it a little bit differently than that. I, I yeah, don't cool. think it would have... Well, two things. First of all, I don't think it would have read the same had the absolutely preposterous rat plan not been a plan that would have also affected human beings. I think that's really important, and I think you're yeah. skipping over that. Uh, because, because like, it's like, the rats are going to steal all the rat poison, they're going to put it all in the reservoir, and that's going to affect the city at large. I kind of felt like over time, Thor develops a kinship with these frogs as he's being a frog, but I really felt like at first I, he was he was respectful to them and he was kind of appreciating yeah. the fact that like he gets to be a warrior even though he's a frog, but at the same time, I kind of got the sense that that had to develop over time. I feel like at first, it was just a matter of the humans will also be affected. I think that if it weren't for that, I don't think Thor would have dealt with the frogs at all. Like, I think you had to have it that part. It makes you wonder, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think that's why Simonson put that in there. 
It also makes the whole thing a little bit more convenient and a little bit more preposterous, right? Because yeah. really, he just happens to become a frog right as <laughs> there's this big rat war with frogs and the rats are gonna ruin the city. And what makes it even more crazy is that, and I'm not even complaining about it because I enjoyed the crazy, but it's, the frogs jump in the shark a little bit. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> The thing, the thing is, the rats are not just trying to destroy the frogs. It's a like almost world domination plot. Yeah, like, they have to like take over like the the park and then yeah, they the go, first the park, then New York, and I'm like, this has gotten crazy. Um, and then there's other little things that made it really hilarious. One of the rats is named Rizzo, which was a <laughs> Muppet rat. And I couldn't believe that. And I was, and I, I'm not sure if Rizzo came before or after this because this is like '85. And Rizzo, I remember being around a lot in the '90s, but I don't remember if he was around before that. But yeah, they have a rat named Rizzo in this. Um, there's, there's a frog that won't stop talking about football. And I, and at first, of course, and I think I was supposed to think this, but I, I didn't. I, I wasn't sure what, uh, what Simonson was doing at first because, frankly, the whole frog thing is so ridiculous. I, I would. I wasn't putting anything past him at this point. And so, like, like I was like, why would a frog know anything about football? He was like, he was like, he was like rattling off teams and scores and things. And then at the end of it, it turns out that this frog also used to be a human, and through some en en enchantment, got turned into a frog, and he. And and, and he's avoided kissing beautiful women because he likes being a frog. He doesn't want to be a human again. And I'm reading this and I'm going, okay, it's, it, it's interesting and it's funny and it pays off the football thing, but it kind of takes away a little bit from the fact that Thor got turned into a frog because this doesn't seem like that big. It seems like it happens all the time. Like, like that, that cracked me up. The fact that this is not that unusual. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was funny too. Um, that was great. The frogs are too personified. That was the thing that that really cracked me up about it. It was like it was like it was like. Of course, Thor doesn't have any problem like relating to these frogs as as regular people. They're, they're intelligent beings. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and they had a society and stuff. Yeah, they had this whole funny. society. They talk they in complete a, they had sentences. A monarch a monarch-esque society just like Asgard there was a king and a queen and a princess and all that kind of yeah, stuff yeah and again it's fun because we're paralleling real Asgard and then at the end of it they try to make Thor their king it's time for them to put a king on the throne they want <laughs> Thor Thor's gotta go get his own throne really like it's almost so ridiculous it works that's the thing yeah. is that like is that like i enjoyed the ideas and things so much and they made me like these frog characters that as impossibly insanely ridiculous as it is i still really liked it um but i just i just want to take a moment and say no <laughs> like it goes way too far i loved it but it, and and the place where it really goes too far for me i don't know if you had this was now that we're personifying animals and having them kind of thought ballooning to each other suddenly the goats are talking to each other like we jump <laughs> over there and it would say it's hilarious and like tooth nasher and tooth grinder are suddenly they're talking to each other and i was like <laughs> now that we have this precedent they could have their own comic book that could happen um <laughs> No, I, I like I can't I can't complain about it too much. I can't. That's the thing is that if the book's not gonna take it tell itself too seriously, I can't take it too seriously. And but then it also meshes okay later. Like like how is it that we get Frog Thor right after the single most morbid idea in the entire book? It's a it's we a go, great sort of alleviation from the the hell arc. Or we go into the hell. That they were doing, yeah. And they're building a ship made out of the dead's fingernails. That's creepy. And two issues later, Frog Thor! Like I can't believe <laughs> that. That's like and 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 like like but yeah. it's it's balanced. It, but you know it's balanced as well as you can balance something like that. I also love how tongue in cheek. The book is it talking about itself and the titles and things. Where like one of the titles is "It's Not Easy Being Green," and uh, you know, there's stuff like that. And then there's like there's like a, there's like a, a point right before the frog thing where they're like 
basically they they're saying oh yeah we're going there you know what i mean like 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 uh, like the most ridiculous thing you will ever see like like i think i think it said something like um like a uh, like so preposterous i don't remember what the word was uh that you'd never think we'd go there and then they go there and um yeah it kind of works because they're owning it you know like yeah I, he, or I'm, simonson's owning it i guess he's doing this oh, he all is, by yeah, himself definitely. yeah yeah it's it's fun it's too much fun it's just so awesome when Thor turns into a six six frog with Thor like gear on and a hammer and like flies into into Asgard and just hammers Loki in the face. It's like the most fun thing you'll ever see in a comic book. Yeah. Or at least for a very long time. And I'm the, with you. And the art there it's like it's it's like grand and fantastic. It's, yeah, you know what it's I mean? majestic. Like, yeah, it's majestic. That's the word I was looking. It's majestic. I can't believe with the frog. But like like Thor comes in and we know he's a frog, and we're just waiting for Loki to have to deal <laughs> with, with with six six. I like that you said that he, he's he's also a six one six frog. Thor. And and uh, and, yes. and and he, and he goes and he goes in and uh, you see him from behind. But you see a little bit of green on his arm, you know, and like and, and like, like like you see you see him flying in, and then you know what's about to happen. Uh, but like the way it plays out is 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 like it's 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 grandiose and it's and it's exciting and it's like like I said it's that big it's that big throwdown you were waiting to see with these two but he's a frog and it's like the book at that point does not care that he's a frog it, it let us laugh at it and now it's not funny now it's just there and it's working and, <laughs> yeah. And, yeah boy i loved it i almost wanted him to be a frog a little bit longer something else i was impressed with simonson for doing was that when thor turns from a frog and i was a little fuzzy about how he turned back could you explain that to me i was a little fuzzy about it um, I think it was Loki was using the sword of Surtur to cast that spell, and when they when Volstag destroyed the generator that it was taking the power off of, then the spell um, dissipated. I'm not sure why it didn't dissipate any other spell that might have been going on, but maybe there weren't any others. Uh, but yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, there was that one where the Loki cast a spell on himself so that the crowd would be more gullible when he was giving that speech you were talking about, and that went away, too. Oh, I missed that! So the crowd was... Yeah. See, I almost wish they hadn't done that, because I thought the speech was viable if they were normal people. Like, I didn't even need yeah, yeah. that. Uh, but, but okay, that's cool. Um... What I really liked, Dan, is that uh, he had, back in Hell, he had uh, that, that thing where his face got all scarred up. And he had to wear that really cool ninja mask. Like, he, like he had this ninja mask cool, yeah. through a lot of the, of the thing. And I really, I really liked that. He was like, he was, he was kind of, he was kind of scary looking wearing that. It was fun to see Thor with a mask. And uh, anyway, when he turns back from, from a frog, he doesn't lose the scars. I was impressed with that. I really thought that was going to be the I out. So. And he has to grow a beard in order for people not to see it. But, like, I was surprised that he still had the scars. Yeah. Yeah, I was surprised, too. Like, this, I mean, when you have one creator and, you know, Busima comes on uh, partway through this to start drawing the book, um, which his art's great as well. But when you have one writer keep, you know, artist keeping track of most of this stuff, the sense of continuity you can have is fantastic. It's and a lot he easier. He never forgets it? about anything. He pays everything off that he sets up. Um, I mean, even if there's stuff here that he hasn't paid off that he started in issue one, and there's not very much, it, most of it's been paid off. He's just building off of threads now and dealing with the consequences of the stuff that's been building since the first issue he, he, he came on the book. Um, it's just it's just fascinating work to see um, how everything plays out. Um, I'm just so impressed with the sense of continuity it's like it's like claremont but not having to wait like 10 years for something to pay off for you you know i mean I, as much as i love claremont he would take much longer than simonson would to pay things off simonson most of the time it's like this you're getting payoff after payoff after payoff it's very satisfying well and it's um, also really satisfying at the same, at the same time he's building new things to pay off later on so he keeps you invested well and also um, importantly it's, it's, the, these characters feel like they're living and breathing organisms that keep organically developing so yeah so exactly. sometimes it's not even so much a matter of here is a specific physical thing that i that i put in here and eventually i'm gonna pay that off a lot more often it's here's a character that's evolving and because we're doing real character driven fiction we're allowing those characters to actually drive this story so just when you thought there was nothing left to say about that character um they'll they'll, they'll go in some interesting direction um honestly 
I kind of thought Balder was played out at this point. I like 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 he's here, and I and I don't really know what the point of him is is after a while because I kind of felt like he had his big moment, and I didn't know why we needed him anymore. And then I realized we had not scratched the surface with that character. Um, Balder, when when we when we get to uh, the moment where Thor decides to put him on the throne, um, that's when he comes alive for me most. I already liked him, but uh, to 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 get the first of all, he is really found come come into his own again right like like he's back to Balder the brave he's lost all that weight i, I noticed that yeah. i thought that was really interesting um and i it, of course that all i think happens in the uh, miniseries that we've not read yet but like he, he has a period right. where where um he kind of he kind of grows his spine back and um so thor uh because he's not the most strategic leader he's almost proving that he's better as a warrior than he is as a leader just by the fact that he picked Balder. Um, mm -hmm. He's going to have to deal with the repercussions of choosing some, someone that ultimately he would not have done a lot of the things that he'll do and might, and I, I don't know what happens later, but might not be the best person to put on the throne. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of foreshadowing that that could be a problem and that they're going to butt heads a little bit. Suddenly, I'm really getting a lot of contrast between them as, as Thor the warrior and Balder the pacifist. And uh, you've got this guy with these pacifistic leanings that you're going to put on the throne of essentially a warrior race. And mm -hmm. Thor's not thinking about that. But then when they have the whole bit in the castle where they've got to fight the trolls and uh, Balder, um, Balder is consistently... Um, criticizing Thor for the way he's handling things because Thor is kind of killing the bad guys first and asking questions later. And um, he and, and, and Balder on more than one occasion says, um, I, Thor, it'd be really nice if we could solve these problems without any death. And you have these two these two big extremes. Thor always handling stuff with his fists. Balder always thinking that you can use the diplomatic solution. What's he going to be like on the throne? I don't think he's the right guy for it. I think he's he's he's, he's too much on the other. And I think the book at this point wants me to think that. That's all really interesting mm -hmm. to me. Yeah, he gets shaped as a leader later later on in really interesting ways. And and I think that um, like you said, that story in the castle, that little adventure they have, is very telling about you know the sort of lifestyles that they want to live like. You see Balder kind of get duped by this spell in this castle. Basically, the setup is this old woman says that there's three maidens trapped in a castle and they need to go save them from this troll. Balder kills the troll, doesn't really ask any questions, and basically lives a life of luxury for, I don't know how long it says, maybe like a couple days or whatever in this tower. He has these three maidens as his lovers and he just kind of stays there, eats a lot of food, and has these girls you know, come at his beck and call whenever he wants them to do anything for him. And uh, Thor goes in and he's not, he's not about that at all. He's not ready to like live any sort of life of luxury or, um, you know, be have reap the rewards of saving these girls. Basically he's, he's instantly less naive and more and, and more suspicious of them. But he, at the same time, he's, that's not the kind of life he wants to live. So, you look at a guy like Balder, like he's a guy that could totally get wrapped up in the life of being a king and being served all, all the time. That could that could get to him. You know what I mean? Um, that that's yeah, something you could put I in front even, of them, and he would take it. Thor wouldn't. You know? Yeah. Um, so that's, that's an interesting aspect of the of the relationship that he would have with his position and Thor too. Because um, well, once you render absolute power and authority to one person, I mean, Thor can say things to him, but there's no controlling him once he gets that power in him. You know, you never know how it's going to change him because it changes anybody. Yeah, that's a good it's point really too. Uh, yeah, I was I was looking at it as as just as the difference between being a warrior and being a pacifist. But you're absolutely right. One of these guys uh, is at a point in his life where he's more easily uh, uh, susceptible to to greed and that kind of thing. That makes a lot. Of, I didn't even think of that. But yeah, that, that's a weakness he has that Thor might have at one time had and has kind of grown out of it. What I really what I what I really enjoy about this is that uh, we, you know, as I was saying before, character driven fiction. 
as as goofy as this can get, um, as, as as silly of a fantasy as this can sometimes be, uh, we are seeing these these characters uh, being you know growing and and being shaped over time. So the reason they're so different isn't just because they have these specific character traits. He's like this. He's like this. Through this run, we've seen them turn into what they are. Yes, exactly. Um, and you don't you don't always well, get that you know and you don't always get a guy on a run that can do it long enough where we actually get to see them turn into this. I, Thor has really matured over this book. Like he was, you know, you know he was at a different place at the beginning of this than he is now. He's more seasoned even in this run, and this is after lots of other Thor fiction. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's it's really interesting to see like. This Thor is much more, at this point, because he's lost his father, he has this unrequited love with Sif. He's got a lot of, a lot of anger in him, so you can see why he's instantly suspicious and not as susceptible to the sort of luxuries and greeds that, uh, that Baldur would want to enjoy, whereas Baldur's coming off of having a wife, having an entire realm at his yeah. disposal when, when he was you know about to get married to Carnilla. He was living a pretty good life before Thor kind of interrupted it and called him to the throne to take on this huge burden. Like, Baldur could have refused it and um, taken that life at the same time. So he's kind of contradicting himself with that castle scene. Like, he's susceptible to the greed, and like you were saying, with the lovers and stuff, but at the same time, he left that same environment to go be the king of Asgard. So what yeah. does that say about him? Well, and it'll be interesting to see where his, where his loyalties really lie. I don't mean between exactly, Asgard and yeah. somebody else, but like 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 whether he's there for himself or he's there for his kingdom. And um, but but I think I think it's also there's there's an inherent contradiction in Thor choosing him too, right? Where where mm -hmm. like where like uh, you know would it have been the more honorable, noble, right thing for him to take the throne um, or not? It, like, it's a little bit difficult to tell if Thor is mostly motivated by his own desires or if he really thinks this is just best for Asgard. Maybe it's a little bit of both, but there's a contradiction between both of those men in really, in similar ways, but opposite ways. Uh, you, you know, that, that's... Exactly. Yeah. And when you think about it, the one person that's coming to seek the throne out of no personal gain whatsoever is Baldur. Uh, the, 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 this game of thrones is being waged in self-interest in Thor and Loki's positions. Thor doesn't want the throne, so he's giving it to somebody else. Loki wants the throne. He's trying to take it from somebody else for himself. Baldur didn't have to accept this burden. He could have just stayed life. where he was. He, he was happy where he was. And he's, he's, having, yeah. to hurt, he, he's having to hurt his girlfriend or wife or, or, or whoever it is by leaving. Um, she's, she's really angry with Thor for taking him away. You know what I mean? Like, he's leaving a happy life for something that's almost certainly going to be really difficult. Yeah, and they say that so you make the, a good those are, who are best suited to power are those who don't necessarily seek it. Yeah. That's an old proverb that I've heard repeated many times in things I've read. So maybe Thor is making the right choice. The fact that these characters are so nuanced that we can examine them from so many different lenses says a lot about the writing. Yeah, because they feel like they feel like real people. They're they're too they're too complex. I can't just I can't point at one and say and, and say well he's so two dimensional that he just does this because this is his character. This is his quirk. This is his, this is this is the uh, negative aspect of his personality that he's always going to act like this. You know, like Loki is the trickster, but he's not just the trickster. You know that you know that kind of thing. Yeah, and when you think about it, Loki is sort of the perfect medium between the diplomat and the warrior, like you were talking about before. If you were to put that guy on the throne, he would be a very effective decision maker, right? Because well, he's I not afraid that. to use force, and he's not afraid to manipulate people through diplomatic negotiation. And I love to villains. Stings himself. I love villains who want to rule everything, and then it turns out that the world might actually be better if they did. You know, like yeah. I, like that's always so interesting. Um, there was a big joke of that made in uh, the the last episode of the Powerpuff Girls, where Mojo Jojo finally gets the whole world, and then he like um, maybe I've mentioned this before, I forget, but like 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 then he, um, he like 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 he, everybody uh, lives a life of luxury, like 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 he turns the world into utopia, and uh, it's hilarious. Mm. But but I mean like 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 with Loki, you know, if he um, if he actually took over Asgard, he'd be a brilliant leader for a while. 
But the problem with them is just what you were talking about. If you are completely self-motivated, um, you you have certain kinds of weaknesses that uh, that that another um, that that another more seasoned, more altruistic, you know, less selfish ruler would have, and. Ironically, that makes you kind of manipulatable. Like if somebody offered him the right thing, yes, exactly that kind of thing. And he's he's a master manipulator anyway. All that kind of that, those kind of politics really interesting in this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, it just seems like there's no perfect right choice to rule, and in the end, because we are real people and we all have our flaws, there is no perfect person to rule. Exactly. I like this book doesn't come on or come down in a place where it's saying this is the right or the wrong answer. Like you said, even without that crowd of with the spells on them, Loki's speech was convincing enough that you could see people legitimately supporting him and nominating him for that position. You know well, especially saying? after the flying hammer. Like, I feel... When, yeah. you, when you mentioned that potion, because I, I missed that, um, I feel myself thinking... Well, he's kind of, uh, uh, no pun intended, hitting it home a little hard there with the flying mm -hmm. hammer because it's like he's already he's already got them under this spell. If you're gonna believe whatever I say, and then he's got and, and then he's 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 got to he's got to dupe them further with the hammer. Um, but I think Loki likes that kind of theatricality. I think that's as much for him as it is for as it is for the crowd. Yeah, and as a schemer and as a leader, he's not a guy that's he doesn't enter into any situation. Without a bunch of backup, without players. knowing that he's going to win. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so um, he would lay it on a little bit thick. Yeah, that yeah. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and um, I'm trying to think what other things. Um, that was the yeah. big stuff I wanted to. Think. This is a really dense section. It is, and we had talked about this as sort of like the breather. But at the same time, these little stories most of the time have the most character work going on. Um, from my experience in like long, long runs of comics, I mean, we got like big shifts in character over the course of the Ragnarok story, but I think this is where Thor is transitioning into who he was at the be at the end of the Ragnarok thing into something new, yeah. and this is all just him changing as a person and all the characters in the book. So um, there's a lot to talk about from that perspective, and that's the kind of thing that me and you usually latch onto. So we've had a lot to say. Uh, yeah, and tough doing these nine issues at a time because there's so much. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually kind of like reviewing it in, ch in chunks this big, though. Oh, me too, um, yeah. Because the progr you can talk about the progression more largely. I feel like if we split this into six um, issue or five issue chunks or whatever, um, it might be a little more, a bit more difficult to gauge like where he's going and what, what we think about it, if you, if you know what I mean. feel a little bit more like reviewing single issues. I mean, we don't have a complete story here, because obviously it's a very large, big narrative, you know, it's a grand narrative, it keeps going. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right, you see more of a character arc. I feel like Thor, within what we read here, has at least one, if not a couple of character arcs. He certainly has an arc with that, with that, with that frog story. I mean, like, when he first gets turned into a frog, he gets more angry about being a frog than anything else I've ever seen him get angry about. Like, yeah. like, like he's so, he's so ticked off, and it, it, it's funny, but then at the same time, you're like, yeah, you know, frog rage! <laughs> and then, and then, uh, and then later on, he comes to appreciate, uh, uh, what the life of a frog is like. And, and that, and that kind of, oh, and I wanted to mention, because I gotta make sure it shows some of these panels, that the moment, and it, I mean, like, it is so dragged out, but it's awesome. For like three pages, Frog Thor as Thor as a regular frog uh, trying to pick up the hammer. It's like this this we 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 like we like live with him and appreciate like every single painful attempt to get that hammer up. It it, it like it reminded me of that like that like uh you know you know Spider Man trying to lift something above his head thing. Yeah, the Lee and Ditko issue where he's in the water and. Trying to lift the big pile of stuff yeah, off. Yeah, of it was yeah. like that. Like, like, like it, it's it's excruciating and it's hard to look at. It's a frog. That's and that's part of why <laughs> yeah. it's so easy uh, to 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 like that stuff. Is that as ridiculous as it is, he milks it for every bit of drama it could possibly give us. Right? Like, oh, like yeah, I could. And then the payoff. You turn the page and he is giant. <laughs> like 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 a uh, uh, anapromorphized Thor on two legs, but as a frog. Like you know, the first time you get to see that, it's like this big triumphant moment. And I'm just like, 
not everybody could pull that off. No, you're not wrong. I, I one of my favorite examples of how he makes the sells the frog thing too is you were talking about when he gets angry when he first tries turns into a frog. Those frog fights are pretty dynamic panel wise in the yeah. way they're drawn. Like he's kicking rats in the face and stuff. Like it, it's as frog fights go, it's probably the most intense frog fight I've ever seen drawn before. It's pretty intense. Uh, so it's like yeah, if you had I mean, a PG thirteen Frogger movie. <laughs> He did go out in the road at one point and was like, oh man, I'm in the road, I better hop away. It was, was a little bit of, of that frogger. It was a little bit of frogger, thing. yeah. Um, well, and, and also the variety of the art, because you never get a bunch of nature stuff in this. Suddenly all the scale is smaller, and so, you know, seeing things from a, from a frog perspective, um, every, everything looks different, and um, suddenly you feel like you're in a different comic book for a while, um, and so the the, uh, the atmosphere there is, is, is nice, because it's just different. You know, we, we, we haven't been to this kind of place before. Um, as ridiculous as the whole rat war thing is, uh, it's it's uh, it's kind of, it's kind of fun to live in that for a little bit. Um, I, I I thought it was cool that he let it go on for a couple issues. Um, I think that was kind of a risky move because he could have lost a lot of viewers, or a lot of readers with that. Like oh, I, I'm imagining yeah. this coming out in, in issues month to month, and you read him becoming a frog, and you go, oh okay, well I mean that's weird, but Loki can do things like that. And then you read the next issue, and you're like, really, we're gonna have to watch Thor. As a frog, not even look like Thor. He's just a frog this whole <laughs> this whole time, really. And then and then it gets into another issue, and I mean, like he's so good at keeping his readers with him. Um, yeah, I mean uh, that was I, I mean, mean that was my my favorite section was the frog stuff. Like like I was more captivated and and and, and uh, fe felt the reading was lighter and faster than any other part of this. No, I agree. I was having a ton of fun with that stuff. Um, I wanted to ask you, too, yeah. because th there is a major um, death of a character in here, too. Um, the death of Malekith. Well, he comes back later in Thor. I know he'll come here. Really, you know. yeah. But the death of Malekith. Uh, what, did you, what did you think of that uh, whole thing? I'm glad you brought that up. I almost ended the show and forgot about that. Uh, and therein lies the problem with it. Uh, I, I thought, uh, and, and I'm, I'm a little conflicted about it, um, I thought that the way Loki handled it was really cool, and I thought that there was some good deception between both of them, but I thought that it was a little underplayed. I was surprised by it. Um, yeah. I felt like he was taken out a little easy, because um, I was immediately questioning his plot. Because basically they're building a stage for the coronation, and it's just Malekith by himself, dynamite. <laughs> yeah. Really? This doesn't sound like a Malekith plot to me. So, I mean, like, he shows up, and all he's going to do is put dynamite on a stage and blow it up. He's basically like uh, like, like, a, like a black and white 1930s, like, uh, like a movie serial villain where he's just, like, putting girls on train tracks. He's that kind of villain all of a sudden. Like, I just, I thought that was weird. Uh, and then, so, like, so, like, the whole business of, like, uh, he gets, he gets put in prison, and then it's and then like uh, the cursed guy uh, shows up and tries to kill him, but like it's Loki and like like all like all the all the misdirection and the and the uh, um, the characters pretending to be each other that was all cool, but I just thought that the way Malekith got there was really kind of forced in. Did you did you feel that way or is it just me? I did feel that way, but I'm at the same time sort of two minds about it. Like, yeah. Because I don't know what else he could like. I I I'm with you. I wanted more. I would have liked the death to have been a little bit more. Um, I guess I wanted to come after the heel uh, off the heels of a big cool master plan. Yeah, exactly. But the but the thing with Malekith, at least in the context of this run, I know his motivations will change later. Like, Surtur is gone. He doesn't have a purpose anymore. So I don't know what his scheme would be. Like I kind of wish Simonson just left him in the dungeon and we didn't see him again for a while until he had something new to do with him. Yeah. Um. Because like immediately right now his purpose with with you know bringing about Ragnarok with Surtur and we compared him to sort of like a terrorist kind of thing. So if he was going to have an evil scheme after Surtur is over, I mean blowing up the coronation ceremony with dynamite would be something I could see someone like him doing. But 
you know, it, it was a little small scale like when you consider he yeah. almost destroyed all of existence, like, you know, four issues ago. Well, and maybe if it had been played up more as an act of desperation, but he seemed to yeah, be acting really like it was... Yeah, get any character stuff with him, because no, it's a part of the No, he's got the same face he's always got. I kind of felt like... It, the prob Part of the problem, too, is that sometimes it's really him and sometimes it's not, so, like, yeah. there, there's a couple panels where it's not really him. Um, but, like, like, I kind of felt like we didn't get enough from him like like the like the attitude he had if he had any was almost like you know this is as clever as anything else i've ever done and like i didn't get that sense of this is desperate wait i'm trying to think too like when he was as loki would he have he wasn't intending to kill himself so his master plan is taking the throne of Asgard in the form of Loki. I just thought of it. Oh wait, if is he's it? in Loki's form, he would he would have been ruling. Yeah. Oh yeah, okay. So it's better then. Yeah. So so the other thing is just kind of a ruse. Okay. Um, that makes that that's kind of cool. No, actually. you're right. You know you know what? Now that you say that, I remember getting to that part and going, oh, okay, this is better. Yes, I forgot about that. Okay, of yeah. course. So his whole well, that's the thing is that you have. You have so many characters in a lot of this pretending to be other people that it's a little bit hard to keep it straight, right? It is, like I said, it's very Shakespearean. No, yeah, I in just that, remember that myself. In, in too, that yeah. way, um, yeah. But anyway, so uh, so you've got okay, so you've got him pretending to be Loki, and then it's not Loki, and then um, when he gets killed, he's actually in the, so that nobody sees. He's actually in the guise, I think, of Balder. Because they make you think Baldur's dead. Yes, they do. And what I liked about that was that um, you, you got to the end of that issue, and they had a blurb at the bottom that said, um, uh, uh, nobody next issue dies, but nobody comes back to life either. And I love that because... It doesn't tell you that what you just saw didn't really happen, and I don't put anything past Simonson. He could have killed Balder right there. Mm -hmm. So I get to the next issue, and I also don't feel cheated that it's actually Malekith, because that's still a huge... He just killed off a major character. So, right, like, yeah. um, he kills off a huge character, but you think it's maybe one person, it turns out to be somebody else, and there's no real reason yet to assume that it isn't Balder, because you don't know that Loki is down there in that dungeon looking like Malekith. Right, exactly. So yeah, that's all really cool. But yeah, the mistaken identity thing, it's really hard to keep to keep up with everybody. And it's it's hard to keep up with everybody, but I think it's for people that are like re, like listening to us talk about it and they're like, "Man, this sounds like the most confusing thing in the world." It's it's a little bit more explicitly said than I think we're making it out to be because it it's hard to describe how it all happens in conversation rather than in reading it on the page. Um, but yeah, I'm with you. Like he misdirects you so much throughout the, the coronation ceremony that it is a little hard to keep track of. But I think once you find out, like you know, that Malekith was was Balder when he was coming uh, to the ceremony the first time, and uh, you kind of figure everything out, and uh, it, it it works pretty well. Well, you're right. That is a way cooler plan than I was giving it credit for. Because I mean, like you've got Loki who steals the throne. And he has manipulated everybody uh, uh, through through all this misdirection. And then you've got Malekith, who comes in and does basically the same thing, and even tricks Loki. Um, so that's cool. Well, you know, I've, I've talked a little bit um, in previous uh, uh, videos about how those two keep kind of running uh, one upping each other. They're sort mm -hmm. of Malekith is like the more the more sinister um, and uh, and more straight up evil version of Loki. He's good at a lot of what Loki's good at, but he's not doing it because he's got this like sad, tainted, tragic past. He's just really evil, and yes. uh, so it's it's a it's a lot of fun to see them as enemies. Because uh, the whole because you knew the whole them as, as sort of pseudo friends thing was going to be uneasy and never work out. Oh, their egos are way too big for those two people to work together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm so glad you brought up the Malekith thing because I almost ended ended before talking about that. Was there any other big thing we need to talk? We've been we've been at this for a while. Yeah, I can't think of anything else. Um, but again, you know, highly recommend this stuff to anybody, even if you've never read any Thor before. You'll become at least a fan of this run of Thor by the end of it. I guarantee, if not a fan of the character in general. 
Well, oh, yeah, that's great, great that's, stuff. That's where I've been, and I mean, like, like I've said before, I never cared about Thor before this. Now I'm just eating this stuff up. It's fantastic. Not my genre, and I love it. Yeah, and there was a lot of parallels in this volume, especially with some of the things that Jason Aaron's doing in his run with Thor being a king and Malekith that I'd like to go back and maybe look at sometime with you in review because um, I noticed some things like with the way Malekith acquired the throne in Aaron's run and Thor being a king, what the repercussions of that are in the future in his run right now. It's all really interesting. So I'd like to, to review Aaron's run on Thor sometime in any case because that stuff's great too. Um, yeah, and it's a lot more layered if you've read this stuff because yes, it's really exactly. building on it, and, and it doesn't—it doesn't feel like it's regurgitating it. It's just—it's building on it, um, and, and and yeah, and it's showing some of the situations Simonson set up, but didn't take that route. Aaron's just yeah. taking like routes Simonson didn't take, which is interesting to see those yeah, sides like, of things. It's like out. doing what if, but in continuity. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> It's awesome. <laughs> Dan, I'm so glad you were able to make it for another one of these. Uh, I hope we can finish this up sometime in the near future. And uh, everybody, yeah, thanks for having me. This is great. Of course, man. Uh, everybody, thanks always for watching. Sure hope you enjoyed it. Uh, and we will see you again, hopefully really soon. I'm Captain Logan. And I'm Dan.